<laughs> Lucy was a girl of indeterminate age with the face and form of a pit bull. She was wearing a shapeless blue smock and her eyes were angry. My attorney was stark naked, standing near the bathroom door with a drug-addled grin on his face. Degenerate pig. Can't be helped. This is Lucy. You know, like Lucy in the sky with diamonds? Lucy? Lucy? Be cool, goddammit. Remember what happened at the airport? No more of that, okay? Lucy! This is my client. This is Mr. Duke, famous journalist. He's paying for this, sweet Lucy. He's on our side. I need peace. The only solution is Mace. No! Not here! We will have to move out! The last thing I needed was a fight to the finish in my own hotel room with a drug-crazed monster. M Mr. Duke is my friend. He loves artists. L let's show him your paintings. Lucy paints portraits of Barbara Streisand. She's an artist up in Montana. What's that town where you live? Oh. Kalispell. <laughs> way up north. I drew these from TV. Fantastic! She came all the way down here just to give all these portraits to Barbara. We're going over to the Americana Hotel tonight and meet her backstage. I hadn't counted on this. We obviously had a serious case on our hands. Finding my attorney whacked out on acid and locked into some kind of preternatural courtship. Well, I guess they brought the car around by now. Let's get the stuff out of the trunk. Absolutely, let's get the stuff. We'll be right back. Don't answer the phone if it rings. God bless. What are your plans? Plans? Lucy. Shit. I met her on the plane, and I had all that acid. You know those little blue barrels? Jesus, she, she's a religious freak. She's running away from home for something like the fifth time in six months. It's terrible. I, I gave her that cap before I realized that shit, she, she never had a drink before. Listen, she's not right for us, not in this fragile situation. It's bad enough if she is what she appears to be, a strange young girl in the throes of a bad psychotic depression. But what worries me is the likelihood that she is probably just sane enough to work herself into a towering Jesus-based rage in a few hours at the hazy recollection of being picked up and seduced in the Los Angeles International Airport by some kind of cruel Samoan who fed her liquor and LSD, then dragged her off to a Las Vegas hotel room and savagely penetrated every orifice in her body with his throbbing, uncircumcised member. She's got to go. I, I can't send her away. Look. Can you see her crashing into Barbara Streisand's dressing room, laying this brutal story on her? They'll track us down and probably castrate us both prior to booking. Yes, you're right. She's going to have to go. The possibility of a Man Act conviction resulting in disbarment proceedings and total loss of his livelihood was a key factor in his decision. Hey, it just occurred to me that she has no witnesses. Anything she says about us is completely worthless. Us? We finally decided to make her a reservation at the Americana. Treat her very gently. She's an artist and might seem a trifle high strung. Good. Then we drove out to the airport and paid a cabbie $10 to see that our drunk girlfriend got safely to the Americana. When we returned, the red blinking message light was on the telephone. What's the message? My light is blinking. Ah, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Duke, yes, you have two messages. One says, welcome to Las Vegas from the National District Attorney's Association. Wonderful. And the other says, call Lucy at the Americana, room 1600. What? Ah, call Lucy at the Americana, room 1600. Holy shit! Excuse me! I felt like Othello. You had been in town a few hours and we'd already laid the groundwork for a classic tragedy. The hero was doomed. He had already sown the seed of his own downfall. This goddamn mescaline. Why the fuck can't they make it a little less pure? Maybe mix it with Rolades or something. Lucy called. What? I just got the message from the desk clerk. She's at the Americana room 1600 and she wants us to call. Hello. Mr. Duke? Yes. Hello, Mr. Duke. 
I'm sorry, we were cut off a moment ago, but I thought I should call again because I was wondering- What? This fucker is trying to spring something on us. What did that crazy bitch say to him? We're watching the goddamn news. What the fuck are you interrupting me for? What do you want? Where's the goddamn ice I ordered? Where's the booze? There's a war on, man. People are being killed. Killed? In Vietnam on the goddamn television. Oh, yes. Yes, this terrible war. When will it end? Tell me. What do you want? <laughs> of course. I thought I should tell you, because I know you're here with the police convention, that the woman who left that message for you sounded very disturbed. I thought you should know this. What did you say to her? Mm, nothing. <laughs> nothing at all, Mr. Duke. I merely took the message. But it wasn't easy talking to that woman. She was, well, extremely nervous. I think she was crying. Crying? Why was she crying? Well, she didn't say, Mr. Duke. But since I knew the nature of your work, I thought... I know. Look, you want to be gentle with that woman. If she ever calls again, she's our case study. We're watching her very carefully. She's perfectly harmless, of course. There'll be no trouble. This woman's been into laudanum. It's a controlled experiment. But I suspect we'll need your cooperation before this thing's over. Oh, well... Certainly, we're always happy to cooperate with the police. Just as long as there won't be any trouble. For us, I mean. So, you'll be responsible then. Of course, and now I have to get back to the news. Thank you. Send the ice. Good work. They'll treat us like goddamn lepers after that. Yeah, you forgot about Lucy. She's looking for you. <laughs> oh, no! She's looking for you. Me? Yeah. She really flipped over you. The only way I could get rid of her out there in the airport was by saying that you were taking me out to the desert for a showdown. That you wanted me out of the way so you could have her all to yourself. Shit. I had to tell her something. I said she should go to the Americana and wait to see which one of us came back. I guess she figures you won. That phone message wasn't for me, was it? I had nothing against her personally, but I knew she was perfectly capable under these circumstances of sending us both to prison for at least 20 years on the strength of some heinous story we would probably never hear. Yes, sir. Those two men over there in the dock are the ones that gave me the LSD Whoa. and took me to the hotel. What did you do then, Lucy? Well, sir, I, I, I can't rightly remember. Indeed. Well, perhaps this document from the district attorney's files will refresh your memory, Lucy. This is the statement you made to Officer Squain shortly after you were found wandering naked in the desert near Lake Mead. I don't know for sure what they done to me, but I remember it was horrible. One guy picked me up in the Los Angeles airport. He, he's the one that gave me the pill. And the other one met us at the hotel. He was sweating real bad, and he talked so fast I couldn't understand what he wanted. No, sir, I, I don't recall exactly what they did to me at that point. Because I was still under the influence of that drug. Yes, sir, the LSD that they gave me. And I, I think I was naked for a long time. Maybe the whole time they had me there. I, th I think it was evening, because I remember that they had the news on. CBS News, that's the way it is. Yes, sir. Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, I remember his face through it. And I'd like to point out, Your Honor, that our prosecution exhibits A through Y are available to the jury. Yes, this incredible collection of illegal drugs and narcotics which the defendants had in their possession at the time of their arrests and forcible seizure by no less than nine officers, six of whom are still hospitalized. These experts have testified that the drug cash in the possession of these defendants at the time of the arrests was enough to kill an entire platoon of United States Marines. And gentlemen, I use the word kill with all due respect 
for the fear and loathing. I'm sure it provokes in every one of you when you reflect that these degenerate rapists used this galaxy of narcotics to completely destroy the mind and morals of this once innocent teenager. This ruined and degraded young girl who now sits before you in shame. Yes, they fed this girl enough drugs to scramble her brain so horribly that she can no longer even recall the filthy details of that orgy she was forced to endure. And then they used her, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, they used her for their own unspeakable ends. Stop! What's wrong? We can't stop here. My heart. Where's that medicine? Oh, the medicine, yeah. It's, it's right here. Don't worry. This man has a bad heart, angina pectoris, but we have the cure for it. Yes, here they are. Turn off that fucking music. My heart feels like an alligator. Volume, clarity, bass. We must have bass. What is wrong with us? But we goddamn old ladies! You scurvy shyster bastard. Watch your language. You're talking to a doctor of journalism. What the fuck is he doing out here in the desert? Somebody call the police! We need help! Hey, thanks for the ride! I gotta go! Hey, pay no attention to this swine. He can't handle the medicine. Actually, we're both doctors of journalism, and we're on our way to Las Vegas to cover the main story of our generation. <laughs> Listen, I really gotta go. The truth is that we are going to Vegas to croak a Scott Baron named Savage Henry. I've known him for years, but he ripped us off. You know what that means? Savage Henry has cashed his check. We're gonna rip his lungs out. And eat them. That bastard won't get away with this. What's going on in this country when a scum sucker like that can get away with sandbagging a doctor of journalism? Hey, thanks a lot for the ride! I mean it! I like you guys! Don't worry about me! Wait a minute. Come back and get a beer. Good red and storm! We had our real freak on our hands. That boy made me nervous. Did you see his eyes? Jesus, this is good medicine. Move over, I'll drive. I have to get out of California before that kid finds a cop. Shit, that'll be for hours. It's a hundred miles from anywhere. So are we. Let's turn around and drive back to the polo lounge and level up first there. Open the tequila. There's a place called Mescal Springs. As your attorney, I advise you to stop and take a swim. It's absolutely imperative that we get to the Mint Hotel before the deadline for press registration. Otherwise, we might have to pay for the suite. Okay, but let's forget that bullshit about the American dream. The important thing is the great Samoan dream. I think it's about time to chew a blotter. That cheap mescaline wore off a long time ago. I don't know if I can stand the smell of that goddamn ether anymore. I like it. We should soak a towel with the stuff, and then put it down on the floorboards by the accelerator, so the fumes will rise up in my face all the way to Las Vegas. No, forget ether. Let's save it for soaking down the rug in the suite. But here's this. You're half of the sunshine blotter. Just chew it up like baseball gum. I took the blotter and ate it. How long do we have? Maybe 30 minutes. As your attorney, I advise you to drive at top speed. My attorney was now fumbling with the salt shaker containing the cocaine, opening it, spilling it, then screaming and grabbing at the air as our fine white dust blew up and out across the desert highway. Oh, Jesus! Did you see what God just did to us? Kill the body and the head will die. This line appears in my notebook for some reason, perhaps some connection with Joe Frazier. Is he still alive? Still able to talk? I watched that fight in Seattle, horribly twisted about four seats down the aisle from the governor. A very painful experience in every way. A proper end to the 60s. Tim Leary, a prisoner of Eldridge Cleaver in Algeria, Bob Dylan clipping coupons in Greenwich Village, both Kennedys murdered by mutants, 
But that was some other era, burned out and long gone from the brutish realities of this foul year of our Lord, 1971. A lot of things had changed in those years. Now I was in Las Vegas as the motorsports editor of this slick magazine that had sent me out here in the Great Red Shark for some reason that nobody claimed to understand. Just check it out, they said, and we'll take it from there. Indeed, check it out. But when we finally arrived at the Mint Hotel, my attorney was unable to cope artfully with the registration procedure. May I help you? Be quiet, stay calm, say nothing. Speak the only one spoken to. Pain, burning, and precipitation. Nothing else. Ignore this terrible drop or ten. It's not happening. Sir, I said, may I help you? Hi there. My name is, uh, Raul Duke. Yes, on the list, that's for sure. Free lunch, final wisdom. Total coverage, why not? I have my attorney with me and I realize, of course, that his name is not on the list, but we, we must have that suite. Yes, this man is actually my driver. We brought this red shark all the way from the strip and now it's time for the desert, right? Yes. Just check the list and you'll see. Don't worry, what's the score here? What's next? Your room's not ready yet, but here's an envelope. Somebody's looking for you. No. Why? I haven't done anything yet. The woman's face was changing. Swelling, pulsing, horrible green jowls and fangs jutting out. The face of a moray eel. Deadly poison! Sir, are you all right? I'll take this. This man has a bad heart, but I have plenty of medicine. My name is Dr. Gonzo. Prepare our suite at once. We'll be in the back. Two Cuba Libras with beer and mezcal on the side. Who's Lacerda? He's waiting for us on the 12th floor. Lacerda? The name rings a bell. But I couldn't concentrate. Terrible things were happening all around us. Right next to me, a huge reptile was gnawing on a woman's neck. The carpet was a blood-soaked sponge, impossible to walk on it, no footing at all. Order some golf shoes, otherwise we'll never get out of this place alive. You notice these lizards don't have any trouble moving around in this muck? It's because they have claws on their feet. Lizards, if you think we're in trouble now, wait till you see what's happening in the elevators. I just went upstairs to see this man Lacerda. We know what you're up to! I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just the photographer. Just remember Savage Henry! Savage Henry? But listen, man. I'm just the photographer. Well, I did it. You freaked. What about our room and the golf shoes? We're right in the middle of a fucking reptile zoo. And somebody's giving booze to these goddamn things. It won't be long before they tear us to shreds. Jesus, look at the floor! God, have you ever seen so much blood? How many have they killed already? Holy shit! Look at that bunch over there! They spotted us! And the last commercial airliner is still flying out of here. Maybe Vietnam, Flight 73. Long gone. China Airlines stopped today, apparently. Can't really see which. This might be Von Zell here. It's probably not. It's more like Cameron Bay or something. In any case, we're leaving Vietnam and I have a feeling that I will not be getting back to it. I don't know why. Maybe I will. Evacuation fleet going to Guam is that interesting? So flaky on speed that I uh, didn't really do something terribly wrong anyway. The moment came when you got so goddamn dingy. And then maybe they were better just to sleep and get seized. The ugliness of what was what we were heading for there was suddenly dawned on me when I noticed that we were running out of toilet paper and uh, stores closing and, and more salad uh, drinks and uh, a whiskey shortage, cigarette shortage, even the in-house phones in the hotel not working. That kind of breakdown, it just makes life more and more miserable. Pretty soon they won't take piastres to pay the hotel bill uh, to uh, 
million dollars. Like last time, just when I checked out, they got the American Express card on. So the next it'll be Piazza. It'll piss a lot of people off, so I can pay at the official rate. Which will be uh, about 8 or 9 to 1 difference with that Any north to the South China Sea to Hong Kong. Again, 10. I guess back to Hong Kong. Bali, God knows where. I do have a suspicion that we will not get back to Vietnam. Uh, yeah, meanwhile, I'll have to get up to the news big office and try to use a typewriter. It's 5.05 .05 in the morning here in Hong Kong. I'm in this luxury hotel. From here, you'd never know that there was a war going on anywhere at all. This place is the height of organized business uh, oriented. Uh, civilization. I doubt that I've ever been in a more organized hotel. The elevators arrive within tw 30 seconds of whenever you hit the, the button. Everything works. Room service is perfect. You can drink the water. There's a television set with two English channels. Radio with two English channels. It's like being in a Holiday Inn. A tall holiday in a Regency Hyatt house with no lobby. But uh, Saigon and the Continental was something else. I kept my room there and paying for it. Might just as well use it. And if the worst happens, well, it just happens. I've been pushing it for a while. About 10 years now, 15, 20. And. I'm not looking for the end, but uh, I'm not that worried about it either. I've had a good time, and uh, made a few points, and I don't know if that really justifies doing uh, kill crazy things or suicidal things. And if I really thought it was suicidal, I wouldn't go back in. But the fact is that it's not safe. And there are a lot of people, a lot of people who uh, know the situation better than I do, who would call it suicidal. And uh, they've all left and admitted that they just didn't want any part of uh, a suicide orgy. I don't think many of the people over there do. Although I'd say there is easy. 10 or 20 percent who welcome it for reasons of their own. I don't have those reasons. I like, uh, I sort of like my life. I'm enjoying it. But I've come this far and it's my story and I blew the last one over in Africa and uh, I think I'll just run with this one. Which means going right back into the eye of the uh, storm. And it will be a storm. We don't have much doubt about that. Uh, the Reuters were today sapping or sappers operating within five and six miles of Saigon. I expect when I go up to the Newsweek office now that there will be uh, reports of sappers operating uh, in Saigon. When I get back, I expect to see uh, see them operating on the streets downtown, Tudor Street, maybe even the Continental Shelf. There won't be any more fresh orange juice and gin uh, with limes. I have no plan to get out. Nowhere to go. Well, we'll see. Maybe uh, the disaster will come before I can get back in. I have about 48 hours just to write this story and get it filed. And if the evacuation comes before then, well, I'll be spared. But I won't be spared. And I will go back. And this is probably the last war that I'll ever fool with. There's too much tension and too little news. Uh, there's no room for interpretation in war stories. It's, uh, it's a competition for 
Uh, we get the first lead out, the first bulletin. I've never been into bulletins. I don't know how to file uh, by cable. I have no cable credit card. I haven't filed by cable since Brazil in 62 or 3. I don't know anything about uh, deadlines, overnight leads, second lead. It's all gibberish to me. I just uh, feel that this is something I should do. After 10 years of uh, fighting this war over there in places like Berkeley and Chicago and uh, God knows wherever else it was, and not really fighting it in an activist sense, but as a obviously biased journalist, then uh, it seems like I should see it and be here for what that one correspondent called the last great Indochina reunion. But I'm sort of an intruder in that reunion, at least in their eyes, but fuck them. Uh, nobody appropriates this story. People try to. If I go in there, I might be the last man into Saigon. Yeah, that might be pretty certain. Nobody's going back in. I mentioned that tonight over at Henry Aronson, Aronson's apartment, and uh, the people eating dinner there were astounded that they, viewed, they, they seemed to think that I had escaped. And uh, the idea that I would go back was just stone out of the question. Impossible. Madness. Which it may be. After all, I have my room reserved for the Continental, number 37. High ceiling, big fan. Windows on the square, white couches. Christ, who could pass that up? It's the best hotel I've ever been in. So, while well, it's there, I may as well enjoy it. I hope you have a nice basement. If not, yeah, if not, if not, if not. Who knows? Chased by police or other plane. So we'll just have to sit here until the authorities can disperse the crowd. I hope you'll bear with us. Well, we're seeing on the runway there's a mob outside the plane. They can't seem to convince them that uh, Lee is not on the plane. You know? Misty windows here in the rain outside. They can't see him, and we can just barely see out. Ladies and gentlemen, would you kindly take your seats? Ladies and gentlemen, kindly take your seats. Come on, Mr. USA, we'll see the plane. Go somewhere else? Well, I don't think it'll work now, really. Well, it looked peaceful. It looked peaceful, huh? Yeah, all of a sudden you get these bursts of movement. People running, but people are coming on board to verify it. Is that on board? 
you ever tell how this works? Yeah, well, just coming here under the seat, you know, somebody saying, I'm the greatest. <laughs> He's back in the back. Mm -hmm. This one long, weird hump in this fucking sky. It's so weird that there's no point in writing it. <laughs> Too weird. I'm going to need my yawn. The fantasy is going to be Reality is going to be on the fantasy. Hear a mob and turn over the airplane and set it on fire. Yeah. How far? Yeah, that's the trouble. It's the kind that is done, bro. I'm going to set the fucking thing on fire. That's right. That's how it is on board. We didn't know it. June 28th, I think it's a Friday. Uh, We are at uh, the Garden of 2018 California Street in San Francisco. My name is Yale Bloor, and I have some uh, observations to make on the use, abuse, and uh, experimentation uh, with and about the drug cocaine. In conjunction with an assignment for Rolling Stone to review, uh, for the purpose of possible excerpts, Sigmund Freud's book entitled Cocaine Papers. Uh, the idea of this tape was to uh, record my own reactions as I went through the uh, attempt to excerpt the book. And some of the reactions I didn't, uh, and comes a fucking tractor behind the road. Yeah, hello tractor. Uh, some of the things that we didn't get into, uh, were discussions of uh, impotence, madness, and the uh, sixth and seventh day uh, freakout, which, uh, in which during which time I found myself, uh, among other things, standing in a freezer for about four hours, uh, doing uh, as much talk as uh, was physically possible to do with uh, people I'd never seen before. And uh, also, uh, things like spilling uh, two grams on a rug. And uh, having to snort it out of the rug with uh, first the attempt of a vacuum cleaner and then uh, straws. An extremely depraved and uh, degrading and uh, embarrassing circumstance to find myself in. And yet at the same time, uh, completely mad, with no sense of values at all, just except to, uh, to seize it this stuff, which I still don't understand. I, I've got to uh, figure out more about this. I don't, I don't, one of the puzzling things about Coke is the desire for it, despite any uh, ability to uh, explain why the desire for it exists. And there are plenty of uh, things in the book, which I've marked, dog-eared and all that, but which uh, we don't have time for here. So, as we, uh, Push up to uh, 138, we're at 130 now. All I can say is that this is not, tape, this tape was never meant to be a commentary on the book. This is the commentary on the uh, person who uh, is excerpting the book and the wretched experiences that accompanied uh, the, what amounted to seven days now, and I'm goddamned if I've been anymore. So uh, the book itself ought to be dealt with at another level. Just for now, we have to uh, say uh, hello, uh, and for now, it's all downhill, but it's all, uh, at least most of it recorded. There appears to be some minimal, but at least noticeable, physical or erotic quality to it. That's about the best I can say for it right now. But uh, nothing anywhere near the effects of mescaline or MDA, any mescaline or mushrooms. So we'll leave it at that right now. It's, uh, it's uh, 11 minutes of 4 on uh, Thursday morning. Betty, bye. Put the screen on the fire, shut the door. 
shoot the peacock. Set fire to uh, the lawn in order to keep the narcs away. And uh, make a lot of telephone calls and threaten all these motherfuckers who have been after me all this time. Those dirty bastards. I know what's going on. I've always been doing this. These, this. My whole life is threatened by these, these scumbags. That's what I should do. Get on the fucking telephone, of course. Why didn't it occur to me? Yeah, let's get the black curl spoon here and get ready for that. Why well, didn't I hear this before? Oh, well, thank God I, it came to me before it was too late. All right, that's segment two. There'll be one more and that'll be it. Uh, now we're in segment three. After a brutal struggle with the uh, tape recorder here. Let's see if. Ah, uh, yes. Ex experiment has not only destroyed my brain, but also my tape recorder by some kind of strange osmosis. <clears throat> this is the uh, fourth night of this dreadful experiment. I would not be inclined, after this experiment, to uh, actively pursue uh, a life constantly flavored or influenced or under the sway somehow of uh, cocaine. And I would hardly advise it. On the other hand, I wouldn't advise anybody to use most of the drugs that I've dealt with from time to time. I wouldn't advise against it across the board, but uh, nor would I advocate it. But there are degrees of advocacy or lack of it. And uh, in that area, I would say that Coke would rank uh, very close to the bottom of my list of things that I would... Uh, Well, think in terms of enjoying either consistently or sporadically at some later date. The odd thing about it, though, which uh, suddenly occurs to me, putting down this glass of wild turkey, which I consistently and sporadically enjoy almost constantly, is that despite that feeling, not only uh, I, but most of the people I know who are into it, seem to be uh, totally unable to resist the uh, opportunity to buy coke. And this is where it gets puzzling. This is where it, you get into the difference between a working uh, social drug or the difference between coke and psychedelics, say. It seems to be very important to be able to, to have coke in a uh, social context. To be able to offer it in some ways is more important than the benefit you get from it personally. Uh, then, what most people consider an excessive amount of hope in a six hour period. My eye, my left eye, I feel like somebody's driven a nail in it and there's nothing in it. I've uh, checked that. It's a very distinct pain in the left eye. My, uh, the inside of my mouth is very dry. My tongue feels like uh, it's twice its normal size. My voice is very hoarse. And I feel uh, something sort of akin to a speed reaction, but, but different. I feel more like, say, staring at the fire reading Conrad than I do uh, any kind of work or any sort of accomplishment oriented thing. I'm drinking some coffee now to uh, see if I can see if it'll have any decent effect on it. So that's uh, aside from the fact that my eye is now falling out of my socket, my red socket, and banging against my cheekbone. Uh, as I say, I feel just fine. I'm going to bed, watching the fire, and let's try this book. Fuck it. It's uh, now. 4.20 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, June 17th.
17th? 18th, yeah. I put some uh, op talk in my eye to try to cure that. It helped for a while, but now it's uh, just as bad. Plus, I can see the dawn coming up, so I want to read just a bit more and go to bed as I experience an episode of soaking sweats and great fear and anxiety, which wouldn't necessarily be due to the book. I was taking blame on that. The piece was interrupted. You know, the piece ended here because the telephone went out. Good news, Mojo. Uh, missed the deadline. Uh, couldn't reach Thompson. And you know, there was no word from him. We became concerned. At this point, uh, uh, Oscar Acosta, the uh, infamous Dr. Gonzo of uh, Las Vegas fame, appeared with his uh, manuscript for his second book. Complete, good health, totally under control. And uh, they'd been, he was living in Mexico, living in, or on his way to Mazatlan for a vacation after completing his book. But oh, uh, to Mexico. And uh, we asked him to rather than Mazelon to go a little further south and uh, since he knew, knew the country and uh, got along well, spoke the language uh, that uh, he would go down and check on uh, Thompson to try to find out what, what had happened uh, there was no word, uh, seven or eight days had gone by, something like that and we gave money for this lots of money yeah, give him a thousand dollars or we should maybe, I mean, that send me like or maybe imply more. Yeah. So it. They're their big property. Yeah. Worth a lot more than a thousand bucks. Well, but they don't assume anything's wrong. They just assume that I'm out of touch. There's, there's no. Like there's, the book was a big town. It's modern. That's true. We, we know Thompson's tendencies. And uh, I can throw something in there in that thing saying maybe I'll go over and see Kissinger or something like that rather than reject it out of hand, possibly. I, I think it'd end on that note, more or less, in my piece. Yeah. I could throw it in, I could, I'll have to write it. Okay, all right. They're, they're already, already interested in, in the idea that Kissinger is down there, and I'm down there, and they can't reach me. Yeah, you're being sent. I don't have to listen to the, the editor's note then. I guess right off the bat, we ought to Ronzo to really to talk you in to writing uh, or interviewing Kissinger. That's right. John Thompson's first story indicates that he doesn't want to, he wants to be part of Kissinger. That's right. Well, right, so I get away from politics. Yeah, but, but they, they want me to do it. Yeah. They can't reach me, so, so they send you down there to, uh, to tell me to do the story. Right. Like, I uh, remember in, uh, like in Las Vegas, you know, the second part of Las Vegas starts out with Gonzo actually telling you, stay there, remember? I've already made the deal. Yeah. So, I mean... Uh, Okay. Your attorney sort of has it, or they think he's got that authority. They think. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. Is that uh, uh, you've been dispatched a, uh, to make the? You've been dispatched to persuade me to write a, a Kissinger story uh, in Nagapoco. Then nothing happens for four or five days. Uh, editor's note. Yeah, yeah, still in the editor's note. And, uh, nothing. No word from any, anybody. We still couldn't reach Thompson. No word at all from Acosta. Then from you comes a telephone call. You're, they're, they're still editor's note. You're in the Las Brisas Hotel, where I, which I've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you offer them the story of, uh, of a, somehow either an interview or something with... Maybe you offer them just an interview with Kissinger. You offer them the same story that they were... That, that they were that uh, I was sent to do. That I interviewed Kissinger. Yeah, I mean, but then you then in the same editor's note. Obviously, uh, Thompson, Acosta, and Kissinger were drinking. You know, getting get along well. Apparently, the three of them somehow. Uh, you know, uh, Doctor Gonzo or Acosta's call uh, said everything was fine. Uh, uh, yeah, more, more money. Found Thompson with Kissinger. Uh, cactus juice, Soho, Las Brisas, a lot more money. But you're offering the story this time, which the editor is puzzled by. But uh, anyway, they're, they're, he's still talking. All right, that's a phone call. Just a straight message.
Well, the beauty of the whole thing is it could be, the whole film could be shot in this one, it's like a Broadway play. It could be shot in this uh, single room. No set, just that one set. Except possibly, yeah, yeah, you just, uh, yeah, we could actually may as well just make a Broadway play out of it, too. Yeah, screen, live drama, novel, yeah, the whole thing. May as well do it all this time. Guts Paul. The Great American Novel. Let oh, me have a flashback. Yeah, that's right. We could use flashbacks and dialogue with these people. Mumbling back and forth each other about lost dreams and memories, old childhood nightmares that come back on them, and that even some of the passengers identify with. So nobody knows who's crazy after a while. Matter of fact, the lunatics appear, as usual, to be saner than the others because they, they're under no pressure. And uh, I guess, yeah, maybe the captain couldn't reappear. And at this point, have the, ca the cabin relatively calm. The game has been won. One coach is humiliated, the other is triumphant. Uh, nobody's protesting any longer. They're all just kind of resting and gasping for breath. And uh, the commander, number three, has put some kind of other, some strange tape on. And the tape, just by this time, the, yeah, puts a weird musical thing on. Which is so clearly strange that it upsets the pilot or co-pilot, whichever one strolls back into the cabin. And now for the first time he realizes that something really unusual has happened, has gone on this flight. He begins to see the steward is not on the nod and people screwed up and fallen out. But uh, these guys are, the commander is talking to him very smoothly and the other one the CIA guy is kind of crouched in the corner and the jock is huddled in his corner. And there's only one football now visible. The commander is flipping it back and forth, rolling it around his hands as he explains it. They just had a little game. Or in his guts ball. And uh, some of the people got a little tired. But uh, it was a wonderful thing. And tried to institute it as a uh, regular thing on the airlines. Every uh, every flight should have every coast to coast flight should have this guts ball with the feature. And then this lunatic possibly coming up with a contract to uh, sort of seal it, offering to have writs of seizure and writs of this, and have these people arrested, filed suit against their lines. Hmm. I don't think maybe we've gone as far as we can here. Certainly far enough for a day like this. It's worth about four or five million right there. Got the screen, stage. Mm, what else? Oh. We'll rest for a half an hour, then we're going to be the judge at the uh, ski thing. See? Mm. What day is it? Yes, Sunday. February 18th. Woody Creek. Lying in bed here in the all farm, watching the sun come up with a head full of mushrooms. And having just created this outline for a uh, massive project, massive. But uh, that's about it for now. <laughs> so we're just weeping now, breaking down. But every time you break down, this lawyer gets on you, offering to. Uh, to file a suit against the airline and file a suit against these, the CIA and file a suit against whatever police force is doing this. And uh, all kinds of trying to make contracts on the spot to sense the contract, all matter of legal language. This thing, and this, the minute this plane touches, I just agree on, we'll file a suit. And meanwhile, it's clear that he's been the one, he's been injected with something. He's totally out of his mind. Well, but it, yeah, it's just nice to have been hurled in the middle of a, a insane asylum, traveling from coast to coast in a compartment of a DC-10.
There's signs of group hysteria and the passengers all and they're being herded around, told to run first down against each other, throw the football back and forth, and runs, kind of strange designing plays too, using the various chairs as blockers. And people, these one of these three, each each one of the first two, number numbers one and two are coaches for these opposing coaches. And they're screaming at their their players. Try to draw diagrams for plays. Obviously, beginning to take it very seriously. Getting, beginning to pour sweat, and uh, you know, drawing out diagrams and pieces of paper and drawing, shoving them in front of people's faces, saying that we got to get these last three yards while shouting and stomping <laughs> the aisles. They're actually forcing the passengers to participate in this twisted game. Got the ball. <laughs> Are you getting ready now? On the needle, yes. I think we have the basic plot pretty well under control now. The situation is set. One of the stewards says this is caving into the pressure and uh, starting to gobble these quaaludes. <coughs> Very shortly, she goes out. You can see her on the nod. So they've lost one, <coughs> lost control of one, whatever stabilizing element one of the stewardess would have been. She's gone. And so there's only one in the first class compartment that I guess is communicating with people in the back and trying to keep under control. <laughs> and uh, also going up back and forth to the cabin. We still have no idea what the hell's going on up in the cabin, or why they haven't landed or what, what they think about it. Just send the uh, cabin door to up front. The pilot's door opens and out strolls up this kind of uh, all American boy uh, co pilot. Who kind of takes a look around and hear people throwing footballs around, laughing and grinning. And the other passengers are still just almost uh, mute, shock. <laughs> These three guys are just giggling and throwing the football around. It appears to be just a normal scene, like a fraternity party with a bunch of footballs. And he says something that would, uh, one of the stewardesses is trying to communicate some horror to him, and, but he kind of strolls out and disappears goes back in and shuts the door. I'd like to be filmed in a way to convey that that was their last hope. The passengers lost their last, had their last shot there to communicate with the outside world and that door shut. That was like the gates of hell playing closed on them. Because at that point, the minute the damn door shuts, these guys flip back out of their, these same three people, back out of their ho-ho having a good time on the first class compartment trip to this menacing shit about the game and that was halftime I know it's whatever it's maybe the two minute rule some kind of terrible intensity you know and some the taste steps up I can't imagine how I'm gonna get this whole fucking room into a one and a half suitcases I have uh Two honeydew melons and about six grapefruit and about four jars of the uh, fruit cocktail, all fresh, of course, to take down to uh, Bruce and Bliss and the people of the, uh, the band. The residue of Oscar's uh, grocery frenzy. Coconuts in there, you know. We got rid of the rest of the uh, rinds and coconuts and broken glass. Oscar took the hammer. He wants his knife now, and I have it. And we'll leave the bulbs here, the blue, the green, the yellow, the red, all the ones we replaced the hotel bulbs with. And the idea is that the maids will never know, because they'll clean the room during the day. And the people who have this room won't uh, turn the lights on until night. And they might think it's nice, you can't tell. I look up at the mirror and see uh, my attorney's horrible scrawled black signature. I don't know how the hell they got it up there. There's the giant black crayon. There. There's also all kinds of big quart bottles of coke around. Half full jars of uh, orange grapefruit cocktail mix. Bottles of rum, bourbon, Chevy's Regal, Schweppes soda, tonic, beer cans everywhere. Box for the Sony uh, radio. Oscar's yellow net shirt, which I've inherited somehow. 
big plastic end pieces for the uh, Sony thing. All the extra pillows I had to get for, uh, for Oscar. Uh, what else? Well, damn it, uh, grapefruits, all the bathroom. My lunch counter has been the bathroom counter. It's about six feet long. We have all the ice in there and the grapefruits, the melons. And out here on the bureau is a booze. Uh, the rug is torn up in the middle. It's about a four foot slash or something right across the middle of the room. I caught my wing tip out this morning and just about uh, fell. I have no idea how I got there. I don't want to know. There's a microphone in the roof. It's clearly that. I think it could be anything else, a giant mic. So we assume they're taping us. But what the hell? Uh, wooden bowls from Taiwan. I'll take those of those if I can. Somehow I lost one of these it's one and a half bags. The big leather one and the small leather one. Oh uh, well. Anything else? We must recall that the man from Georgia and his murder cases, we had that. We had the uh, narcotics testing kit, the kits which I have in the uh, suitcase. And now I suppose we have to figure out what the fuck to do with this story. But maybe I should go down and have one last run in the Great White Whale before uh, we get to that. It could be nasty and I'm quite tired. My lips are dry and my mouth feels like concrete. It's not good. It's lack of sleep. Constant drink. No sleep. Any pills. You wonder sometimes what the hell it's going to lead to. I'm covering a narcotics and dangerous drugs conference. So drugged up and crazy that uh, I should be put in a rest home. If not the jail. But I've done nothing. I'm innocent. I have no guilt. That's a good note to close on, I suppose. No guilt. But what do you call it? What is it? What's the word? I'm a word man, we'll find it. Las Vegas, April 29th, Thursday night, after the DA's convention, Heading back to Aspen tomorrow morning, putting final loads together. Thursday night. Something happening there? Or no? It's down in the deep, dark, tinted glass. We see something turning. Yeah, let's make some final loads before we, we flee. The whole room is total chaos. There's no way to put the stuff together. You just have to put it all in a bag and get the hell out of town. No. The most important thing I think is the, uh, the lesson of the beating in the uh, booze bottles. I just tested the uh, theory of the cop from Athens, Georgia. I uh, couldn't say theory, he was quite sure of it. I did it during the test on uh, Chevis Regal, uh, Old Granddad, and Bacardi. And the Bacardi failed totally. Old Granddad was not much better. And Shepard Riegel did what he said would do. The theory is that in very good liquor, booze, moonshine, whatever, something called beating oil is uh, somehow comes to the surface. I'm not sure why or what it is. The test is that if you shake it up, and where the uh, when the shaking settles at the line the top of the booze, there'll be a sort of a foam, and uh, when that settles, it leads to settle into very tiny small beads all in a row, which is a beading oil showing up, and these, are, these will be stable, they'll stay in good booze, whereas in cheap shit there'll either be no bubbles at all, no beads, which is a sign of really gross stuff, I just don't want to touch it of this Bugatti rum. Or, as in the case of Old Granddad, there'll be larger bubbles, 
and they won't be as stable, they'll pop. So uh, with the Chevrolet Regal, which I'm staring at now, it, uh, it worked. A lot of small bubbles appeared around the top of the uh, body of whatever was left of the scotch, and they, uh, they hung there. So that's uh, probably the most important thing I've learned here in uh, these four or five days in Las Vegas. Uh, um, yes. Maybe I'll drive back in one of these weird holes and see what's back there. We have a strange road going off into nowhere here. There's people back in the wilderness. It's peeping out. You see flashes of people moving here and there. What's this? A fucking theater? Jesus, there's a little amphitheater stuck out here, just completely in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. It's very weird. That's supposed to be the outside of a trailer park. That's what it is. People are all watching things with, oops, there goes the guy into the lake with a, off the parachute. Holy Jesus, it's a giant trailer park. I'm on the bottom end of it. Service road only. Here I am banging along in this white Cadillac. Well, we'll see what it services. Another beach I've hidden here. One or two people down there. Hmm, I wonder if the road continues. Well, let's see. Oh my god, the road ends right here in front of it. Bang. I'll just keep going right toward the water. Right into the uh, Zang. Yes, here we are. Well, out in the desert. Let's see what kind of springs this car has. I took it out there. Just barely missed it. I thought the whole drive shaft was going to break. If this lake is uh, how warm it is, better go over and see. No, I think I can drive down toward the hole over here. What the hell is this big? These big dips. Like some kind of a. Oh my God! We're going in circles. Shit! Jesus! That last bump was so violent it bounced the tape recorder. Uh, off. Right in the front seat, jumped about four feet in the fucking Those piano keys. Uh, were jolted to an off position. I'm down here by the water now. I wonder if I can get any further down. Maybe I better be a little careful here. It's like treacherous sands. No, fuck it. Let's just get out there in the. Let's go and see. See if we can get across this treacherous sand. I don't see any tracks here. Ominous, ominous. Oh, my God, here, oh, Jesus, I can feel the thing sinking. Maybe I get down right next to the water. The sand is hard. Yes, my God, here we are. Yeah, it's two feet from the fucking water. Good. A huge tidal wave will come in on me. Oh. oh, now we must get in the water. Yes, of course. Oh, shit, like the scummer. A matter of algae floating up. I only have to get back out of this damn hole here. I think we have to hit it very fast. I don't know if I can get up the turn again. Oh, God. Feel it digging in. Oh, God damn. Get across that fucker. Yeah, so oh, shit. God, Jesus, got here and stuck him to push a fucking Cadillac. Uh, I'll never make this turn. Never, never. Oops, can't get over the hump. Yes, over the hump. I'm going back out. Oh, the wrong gear. Shit. Yeah. Backing up. Oh, don't get stuck, you son of a bitch. Oh. Jesus, I just found a bun crushed along with the floor of the car underneath one of these rubber mats. It's not even cooking down there in the sun for two or three days. Full of cheese, old tomatoes all fried up, or boiled up, whatever the hell happens to tomatoes in this kind of sun. Underneath the mat, it all worked itself into the, uh, the red uh, rug flooring. The thing of beer turned over in the back seat, soaking the, uh, the back floor. Adorably rotten half before I get it back. Yeah, there's a cop again. God damn it, I'm coming into this uh, marina. Let's see what the hell it is. Arrows saying keep left. Boat launchings. Boat landings. Um, let's head over here to the boat launching. Right. It's 
stare at things from there. And what that fucking cop is doing here. He was coming out of that marina as I'm turning in. I'm gonna see what he's doing up there. Yeah, there's some large boats there. Like, like 30 foot cruisers. There's a power trimaran. That's weird. I've never seen that. A few, quite a few uh, racing holes. Uh, what do we call those fuckers? Uh, power jacks, flip kettles, or something. Weird place to see boats out in the middle of this goddamn desert. You don't expect it at all. Oh, look, we're find that fucking cop again. Let's go someplace and hide. Oh, Jesus. It's up the back of the car wiped out. There comes another cocksucker. Every time I try to stop somewhere, some waterhead is right behind me. Move, motherfuckers. Get out. I was just driving along watching this guy being towed in a parachute around the lake. And I saw a chance to turn off, so I started slowing down, and apparently this freak behind me was watching the same thing. Suddenly, this ungodly screech of rubber. Luckily, I hadn't totally stopped. So I was able to hit the accelerator and uh, get out of his fucking way. I just pulled over and shaking my fist at him and grinding my teeth. Flung off on the side road. Tell me, if the fucker comes in here, I'm doomed. No, oh, there he goes. He's slowing down. He's watching me. Why would the hell would a person in a white Cadillac suddenly go off into the desert on the side road? Yeah, he's slowing down. He's watching me. What the hell is this? Blasting signals. All clear. One warning. Five minutes prior to his shot. Series of blasts. Huh. Fucking radio off. Five minutes prior to the shot, I'll hear a series of blasts. At which point, I'm not sure what the hell I'm supposed to do. Drive at high speed in some direction. There appears to be some kind of, yeah, some kind of huge munitions factory or something up here. I wonder if that creep's gonna come in here after me. Damn his ass. Scum, can't leave a man alone. All I wanna do is sit out here and drug up. Get all crazy. Seems like a decent thing to, decent way to behave in an afternoon. Of an afternoon, as it were. There's no place you can go here. Another danger thing. Weird road going uphill. I'm back on the lake, but I can't see it. This may not be the place to go. I think this is gonna fuck them around some. If I keep coming up this way, I see some kind of a tower at the top of this hill. Hard hats required. No authorized personnel behind this, beyond this point. No visitors. Tab Construction Company. Mm. What the fuck is this? Well, whatever it is, I see a chain up there and a pole across the road, a big tower. And this cop after me. I don't think I need this. Back up. Get right down and behave like all the other tourists. Let's see if I have any more. Tape here. Got them. I'm soaking wet. Two scenes we should probably get down. One uh, happened yesterday that I don't think I have anywhere, notes or anywhere else. The, uh, let's see, I stayed up all night, the night before, because I had to get Oscar on the plane. And, uh, consequently, I managed to make the 9 o'clock session in the morning on where do these drugs come from. Like everything else at the conference, it was just old, uh, stale bullshit that nobody, uh, everybody knew, and nobody saw any point in talking about. Let me get this goddamn window up. I can't hear anything. And I have motorcycles coming at me, and cars turn into a one-lane road here. Oh my God! I don't have to. Uh, I put the uh, windows up with buttons. I'm trying to lean across the car. Oh, it's wonderful. Jesus Christ! The button just went shooting right up. Surrounded by glass. Silently rising out of nowhere. Beautiful. Fantastic, fantastic. The, uh, there was some fool of Nixon's there, some uh, geek who looks like Melvin Laird from the Treasury Department explaining where the drugs came from. And throughout about an hour and a half of conversation, all of it fairly intense, this man, nobody in the whole place, a thousand dope experts supposedly, or incipient dope experts, Plus this uh, 
true expert from the uh, Treasury Department. Nobody mentioned anything about Laos or Vietnam or any heroin coming through there. It was all this whole uh, organized crime uh, syndicate business. South of France, Turkey, Marseille, that sort of thing. And I was going to, I was going to mention it, this is as a form of a question from the audience of a thousand, but uh, nobody else seemed to be getting any, any satisfaction from their questions. So I didn't see any point in suffering through it myself. It's been that kind of uh, situation all along. Nobody really participates in the thing. You just sort of listen to this old wisdom being uh, ladled out from the fucking uh, table on there by these guys and the little professors in black t-shirts or other black, uh, what do you call them, bow ties and white, white shirts and little black suits. But uh, after that session finished, there was a break coffee break, they said, and I went outside to look at the exhibits. The uh, various firms have set up uh, exhibits around the outside of the hall where they held most of it. And uh, I was picking up a deck of cards uh, with all manner of dope wisdom on the back of it. Two of them, one for Rolling Stone and one for me, and strange buttons that said, uh, get wise, not weird, and all kinds of applications for certificates saying that, uh, for instance, that I, I could for five dollars, I got a certificate commending me for my uh, dope research, a research on drugs or something like that, and drug exhibits, uh, various types of pills. And actually, I should have stolen one of the drug exhibits. I could have gotten totally crazy with that. Uh, could have been placebos, but I, I doubt it. The pills look real. They're all uh, carefully under glass. Then I came over to one of these tables where. Uh, at this time, people, after two or three days of this, people are aware that, uh, most people in the conference, anyway, are aware that uh, there's something wrong with me, with my uh, presence there. It's not, not quite right. And I've been getting this you know, flashes in the past 48 hours or so. The first day wasn't, yeah, the, even the first day was weird. Because we began uh, in coats and ties and that sort of thing, wing, my wingtips. And then slowly disintegrated to the point where Oscar finally ended up uh, Dressing in a yellow uh, net shirt with a uh, honey knife on his belt. And his argument was that the honey knife wasn't concealed because it showed through the net, which only made it seem uh, more hideous. Uh, let's see, we're approaching something here. Hoover Dam, 16 miles. Boulder City, 15 miles. Must be a lake up here. Put a tree in sight. It's pure desert country. Belching here. After eating a, a Burger King Whopper burger and uh, some beer, I went outside during the break and probably ran across the only person, or the only people in this group behind the tables, these salesmen who weren't aware that there was something wrong with me. And uh, by some sort of accident, I had an Oscar's name tag instead of mine. Let me make sure I'm getting this before we continue. Highway heading toward uh, Lake Mead and the Great White Whale. Spilling beer on my crotch again. Just stopped and traded in four warm beers for six cold beers and 60 cents. Then we go out to the lake and take a look at it. Try to see. Uh, what kind of story this might be? We put it together. Never want to miss a chance to drive around Las Vegas in a big white Cadillac convertible in the sun. First day the sun's been out in the afternoon since I've been here. Can't tell if this fucking mic is picking up all this uh, wind sound or not. Man, so you go to the light and turn left. Oh yeah, I see the light up there. Very confusing story so far. I'm not sure whether it's a story on the uh, DA's convention and drugs, or whether it's a story on Las Vegas and something else, or uh, just what the hell it is. Got to somehow organize it. Oscar fled in terror. Went to Oakland. Turned out to be fairly useless, except that he did uh, pay the $200 to... Uh, Get us registered. 
Well, he didn't pay it. He just gave him a bad check. So I gave him the 200. Seems fair enough. So when they come after me for uh, failure to pay, well, it's have to tell them that Mr. Acosta was in charge of that. My attorney, excuse me. My attorney handles all those things. We'll see what, uh, what he does. We're going to the uh, pussy cat now. Pussy, what, what is it? She got a go go. Pussy cat a go go. Right underneath the, uh, right underneath the Arco gas station. What's that thing next to it? Rose Fowl? Rose yeah. Bowl. Yeah, the Frontier Club. National Car Rental. They mentioned girls. That horrible place on the streets is Dancing. girls, girls, girls. Yeah, this one's got. Dancing shows, casino bar food, sports, oh, you go. Rose Bowl. Can you get in here? Yeah. So, so it's not good. I don't know if we get it up. Yeah. Can he get out? Well, I think we're okay. They sell them here? Part of the prize, a uh, dance contest. Uh, oh, that's the same thing? Every contest? Tuesday night we have a dance contest. Like tonight. Then uh, the fourth week we get the grand winner, and that's part of the prize. We have had her some uh, choice. Uh, is the uh, dance contest just for girls or for guys too? Well, all girls together. Yeah, yeah. Oh. go go stuff. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. What is in the top of us to start making that appearance? What is in the top of us to start making that appearance? Oh, no, we're, we're not allowed to have a car. Is there a top of us in town? Uh, the big hotels, yes. But, but not, not on the strip. It's going to have something on it. Downtown, I think they have. Uh, a lot of the big shows at night, they didn't get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like the goddamn thing myself. You're looking for all my time to be on. So let me keep your eye on this, make sure we don't go wild. I'll have a couple of evidence. I'll have to go wild in a Budweiser. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry
we haven't dealt professionally with the media the more you know. I've seen no media at all. That's the first one I've seen. Yeah. That doesn't mean it has anything to do with the conference. No, but we can ask for what we don't care about the conference. We want the story. Yeah, that's from a the local, local dream. station. I think we are serious to get to and look for the American dream. Right in the middle of it. Like, there she is. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't her. Then we, we just ought to start interviewing people and ask them, you know, what is the American dream and where is it? But, you know, right on the street, sidewalk interviews. Yeah. You know, I remember the way those, uh, there were these two guys in Frisco, these two uh, radio uh, oh, yeah, I remember that. freaks. Yeah. They, they, they made a whole uh, series of that kind of stuff. They pulled it off real well. I never could quite believe they had all those things straight. Well, I'm sure they, uh, you know, redid them. Drugs. Remote control, RM-15. What's it is date? now 11.30 a.m. Moby Dick is pulling away from Building 9. <laughs> oh, fuck, I forgot my sunglasses. I have to buy some more. Sorry. We are going out of... Again, in search of the American dream, we've yet to find it. We don't think it's at the district attorney's convention. Nothing's happening there. They're all a bunch of undelivered liberals <coughs> dodging all the significant issues of the day. They're spending millions and billions of dollars on rehabilitating persons that they would obviously like to kill. So all they're doing is fecking them up for the kill. The eventual kill. We are here to see to it that it happens to assist them in any way possible. <laughs> to give them all information, moral courage, and drugs. <laughs> Those fuckers could do it better if they were on drugs. <laughs> Um, what we think is your use of rest, but I'm not going to do that. 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 I'm not Monday afternoon, we have a white Cadillac convertible. We just got sent $500 Rolling Stone. It's important that we get the other 500 Well, that won't come here. That'll go to my bank. It went very good. I didn't think about that because I can't cash checks on it. Smoothie waste. Well, we don't have to spend the money to, you know, to make it. Then when you get back home, you have 500 bucks. Yeah. You can see. read these telegrams into the record. There's <laughs> <laughs> the music yes, in the back, Mr. Thompson, yeah. did, you, uh, did you send out a, a telegram uh, this early this morning at about uh, 4, 4 a.m.? <laughs> must have freaked the uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim Silberman, right of house, 201 East 50th, Thursday Ice, New York City. Send it once today, important, $500, my account, Bank of Aspen, against American Dream account. Stop. All settlements pending. No details possible. This medium. We'll call later today, tomorrow, with massive wisdom. But meanwhile, send the five, five, five. Thanks. Hunter Hotel Flamingo, Las Vegas.
I'd like to get anywhere out of the States. Oh, really? Well, Brazil is not only the, the most beautiful country I've ever seen, but the people are fantastic and just a nutty. Yeah. Well, you get tired of them after a while, but. Uh, Rio de Janeiro? We live there, you know, but I've you know, been around the, the thing. It's just, oh, it's Christ, it's bigger than this country. Oh, yeah, I know that. And it's the only place in the world left that I know of that really has a wild west. Yeah. Now, you know, out in the Mato Grosso. Yeah. Out there, you know, you wear a gun on your hip. The gauchos and the whole thing, they yeah. fight with knives out there, yeah. and they got something going. Well, that Green Mansion is a book about it. Yeah, that's... Uh, I read that book. That's a great book. That's a classic. It is. That was done, though... Uh, that's a long... That book's been written, written a long time ago, 20 yeah. years ago. But the odd thing is, a lot of parts of the hell, the Amazon jungle is the largest unexplored territory left in the world. I know it. Yeah, even in that New Guinea. Oh, but New Guinea's not anywhere near the Amazon. <coughs> the Amazon itself is like... Uh, How would you like to be brought up like that kid was brought up, with that man in that book? He was brought up, he was fighting with a knife when he was four. Sleeping with Eric County, I don't know uh, what kind of sentence I'd get, but uh, I'm sure it'd be an ugly one. We've had a very peculiar weekend, very, very strange, uh, almost surrealistic kind of uh, action. I seem to be on the way out of uh, Madeira County almost, uh, coming into Mercedes. I have a feeling I'm out of the county. Some loon is going to be behind me with his price on. The uh, the reason I want to get out is because I've been giving the police such uh, head and, and uh, back talk for two days. Now, uh, the, after Grant's arrest, uh, at which I, point I gave them more uh, violent head and uh, noise and protest and all, that if I do get caught here in this county for anything, it would be, they would uh, clamp the seals down on me and that would be it. I'm going to stop here in, in Versailles for a minute and call Sandy and tell her I'll be in about uh, 12 or 1 tomorrow. And then go find a side road and flip the seats back and go to sleep. I'm worn out from this goddamn weekend. All the uh, empty cans and, uh, and beer cartons are up on top of the car. This has been sort of the beer uh, cooler. The uh, camp. I, it, when I arrived here, I was about the uh, third or fourth car. Now I'm one of maybe 20 cars, and I couldn't get out tonight if I wanted to. And uh, the road's blocked up. We're in a sort of semicircle down a very long, not long, but a half mile of uh, trail. Which, if it were any worse, I couldn't have got down in the car, but it's not that bad. All the cycles can get by easily. And the sheriffs have all gone, uh, it appears that everyone's drunk. And, uh, there's been a bit of hooting, shouting, uh, great, uh, instant gang huddles. That, uh, something to do with the lodge, I have to ask someone about. And, uh, copious use of, you know, uh, the weed, the pot, the grass. They call it weed. Mm -hmm. Unlike the hipsters of uh, Hollywood, New York, where it's either a part of the grass, There's, to these people it's the weed. And, uh, and incredible use of uh, benzodrine pills. Uh, uh, the uh, it's about 4 o'clock now, and uh, I'm dead on my damn feet. I'm really uh, trying to move around in a zombie-like approach to life. They appear to be a uh, hardcore all-nighters. We're up at Bass Lake, and uh, I wish I had a camera. God damn, I'd have gone ahead for a camera, although that probably would have cleared my whole image as a... Uh, 
fitting into it. So far, they I managed to uh, be a part of the scene without really being a total, you know a real integral part of it. But uh, we we got we get along well enough, all of us. And only uh, now and then do I get some. Uh, argument or a bad head from somebody I don't know, I've never seen, somebody from some other club. But in a situation like this, uh, you absolutely have to have the leaders and the uh, big lads on your side, you may as well leave. And luckily, uh, I have that, that situation right now and that just isn't keep it. It's, uh, Sonny is uh, an amazing kind of leader type. He's uh, what the child psychologist uh, point to at five or ten or twenty, I suppose, as a natural leader, and he is so much that they uh, even call they call him Papa, Daddy, they jokingly. But there's more, more to it than just a joke. He's a uh, he's totally in charge of this whole thing. He's 27 years old. He's uh, kind of a long, straggly beard, very long hair. I can't remember whether he wears a ring, a ring or not. I'm sure he must. Uh, but a, a good uh, kind of wise face and uh, very bright eyes and a, not as articulate as he might be, but uh, very sharp, very uh, quick on the uptake. Uh, with the sheriff, he gives the sheriff no quarter, and, and you know, not in terms of uh, asking for anything or demanding anything, but just. Uh, the score is a score, and he insists on it. Like I remember him saying, uh, well, let's face it, Sheriff, we're all fucked up, so we wouldn't be here. People crazy. Nobody on the Palm Beach Express seemed very interested in that question. Instead, the community rallied around poor Pete Pulitzer when the deal started going down, even through 18 days of weird courtroom testimony that mortified his friends and shocked half the civilized world. The most intimate aspects of his wild six-year marriage to an ambitious young cheerleader from Buffalo were splayed out in headlines on the front pages of newspapers in New York, Paris, and London. Total strangers from places like Pittsburgh and Houston called his wife at home on the telephone, raving obscene proposals. Vicious lawyers subpoenaed his most private belongings and leaked whatever they pleased to giggling reporters. Any tourist with a handful of dimes could buy Xerox copies of his personal tax returns or even his medical records for ten cents a page in the Palm Beach County Courthouse. His privacy was violated so totally that it ceased to exist. At the age of 52, with no real warning at all, Herbert Pulitzer became a very public figure. Every morning he would wake up and go downtown with his lawyers and hear himself accused of everything from smuggling drugs to degrading the morals of minors and even committing incest with his daughter. The only charge Judge Harper took seriously, though, was Roxanne's adultery, which was defined so many times by so many people that it came to be taken for granted. No adultery was ever proved, as I recall, but in the context of all the other wild charges, it didn't seem to matter. Quote, he told me if I didn't sign those documents, he would take my children away. He said he had the power, the money, and the name. He said he would bury me. Unquote. Roxanne Pulitzer, in court, November 15, 1982. The husband was never pressed to confirm that quote. The judge performed the burial for his own reasons, which he explained in a brutal 19-page final opinion that destroyed Roxanne's case like a hurricane. In the end, she got even less than her lawyer, Joe Farish, whose fee was reduced by two-thirds. He got $102,500 for his efforts, and the wife came away with $2,000 a month for two years. No house no children, a warning to get a job quick, and the right to keep her own personal jewelry in her own car. The whole package came to not much more than Pulitzer had spent on the day-to-day -day maintenance of his boats in 1981, which his accountants listed at $79,000. The $441,000 the couple spent that year on miscellaneous and unknown was four times what the wife was awarded as a final settlement after six and a half years of marriage and two children. It was nothing at all little more than $100,000 on paper, and in fact less than $50,000. There are dentists all over Los Angeles who pay more alimony than that. We're not talking about dentists here. 
We're talking about dashing millionaire sportsman from Palm Beach, a wealthy jade of sorts who married an ex-cheerleader from the outskirts of Buffalo and took her to live sex shows and gave her jars of cocaine for Christmas. In a nut, Herbert P. Pulitzer rented the best piece of ass in Palm Beach for six and a half years at a net cost of about $1,000 a month in alimony. And when it was over, he got the house and the children along with everything else. That's not a bad deal on the face of it. The worst piece of ass in San Francisco goes for at least $100 a night at the Siamese massage parlor, and that can add up to a lot more than $1,000 a month. Dumb brutes, women so mean and ugly you don't want to be seen with them even by a late-night room service waiter. There's a bull market for whoremongers all over the country these days, and the price of women is still not going up. Judge Harper had run the whole show with an evil glint in his eye, enduring a shit train of perjury from both sides, and day after day of relentless haggling and posturing by teams of Palm Beach lawyers, and a circus parade of rich fools, dumb hustlers, and dope fiends, who were all getting famous for just being in his courtroom, where smoking was not allowed, except for the judge, who smoked constantly. That should have been the tip-off, but we missed it. The judge had made up his mind early on, and the rest was all show business. A blizzard of strange publicity that amused half the English-speaking world for a few months, and in the end, meant nothing at all. Toward the end of the trial, it rained almost constantly. Logistics got difficult, my suite overlooking the beach at the Ocean Hotel was lashed by wild squalls every night. It was like sleeping in a boathouse at the end of some pier in Nova Scotia. Big waves on the beach, strange winds banging the doors around like hurricane shutters, plastic garbage cans blowing across the parking lot at 30 miles an hour, darkness and chaos, sharks in the water, no room service tonight. It was a fine place to sleep, wild storms on the edge of the sea, warm blankets, good whiskey, color TV, roast beef hash and poached eggs in the morning. Fat city, a hard place to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and drive across the long, wet bridge to the courthouse in West Palm. One morning when I got there too late to make the list for a courthouse seat and too early to think straight, I found myself drifting aimlessly in a dimly lit bar on the fringes of the courthouse district. The kind of place where lawyers and bailiffs eat lunch, the bartender has a machine pistol and the waitresses are all on probation, where nobody reads anything in the newspapers except local gossip and legal notices. The bartender was trying to find limes for Bloody Mary when I asked him what he thought about the Pulitzer divorce case. He stiffened, then leaned quickly across the bar to seize my bicep, and he said to me, You know what I think? You know what it makes me feel like? Well, I said, not really. I only came in here to have a drink and read the newspaper until my trial breaks for lunch, and never mind your goddamn trial, he shouted, still squeezing my arm and staring intently into my eyes, not blinking, no humor. I jerked out of his grasp, unsettled by the frenzy. It's not the goddamn Pulitzers, he shouted. It's nothing personal, but I know how those people behave and I know how it makes me feel. Fuck off, I snapped. Who cares how you feel? Like a goddamn animal, he screamed. Like a beast! I look at the scum, and I look at the way they live, and I see these shit-eating grins on their face, and I feel like a dog took my place. What, I said? It's a term of art, he replied, shooting his cuffs as he turned to deal with the cash register. Congratulations, I said. You are now a doctor of torts. He stiffened again and backed off. Torts? What do you mean, torts? I leaned over the bar and smacked him hard on the side of his head. That's a tort, I said. Then I tossed him a handful of bills and asked for a cold beer to go. The man was slumped back on his rack of cheap bottles, breathing heavily. You whore-faced bastard, he said. I'll kill you. I laughed. Shit eyes. People like you are a dime a dozen. I reached over and grabbed him by the flesh on his cheek. Where's your dog, swine sucker? I want to see the dog that did this to you. I want to kill that dog. I snapped him away from me and he fell back on the duckboards. Get out, he screamed. You're the one who should be on trial in this town. The Pulitzers are nothing compared to monsters like you. I slapped him again, then I gathered my change and my mail and my newspapers and my notebooks and my drugs and my whiskey, my various leather satchels full of weapons and evidence and photographs, packed it all up and walked slowly out to my red Chrysler convertible, which was holding two feet of water from the previous night's rain. You skunk, he was yelling. I'll see you in court. Must be a lawyer, I said. What's your name? I work for the IRS. Get out, he screamed. I'll be back, I said, lifting a small can of mace out of my pocket and squirting it at him. You better find a dog to take your place before you see me again, because once I croak those scumbags I'm working on now, I'm going to come back here and rip the nuts right off your ugly goddamn body. 
man was still screaming about dogs and lawyers as I got in my car and drove off. People in the street stopped to stare, but when he begged them for help, they laughed at him. He was a doctor of torts, but in the end it didn't matter. A dog had taken his place anyway. Long after the Pulitzer divorce case was finally over, after the verdict was in and there were no more headlines and the honor of Palm Beach had been salvaged by running Roxanne out of town, after all the lawyers had been paid off and the disloyal servants had been punished and reporters who covered the trial were finally coming down from that long-running high that the story had been for so long that some of them suffered withdrawal symptoms when it ended, long after this, I was still brooding darkly on the case, still trying to make a higher kind of sense from it. I have a fatal compulsion to find a higher kind of sense in things that make no sense at all. We were talking about hubris, delusions of wisdom, and prowess that can only lead to trouble. Or maybe we were talking about cocaine. That thought occurred to me more than once in the course of the Pulitzer divorce trial. Cocaine is the closest thing to instant hubris on the market these days, and there's plenty of it around. Any fool with an extra hundred dollar bill in his pocket can whip a gram of cocaine into his head and make sense of just about anything. Ah, yes, wonderful. Thank you very much. I see it all very clearly now. These bastards have been lying to me all along. I should never have trusted them in the first place. Stand aside. Let the big dog eat. Take my word for it, folks. I know how things work. In the end, it was basically a cocaine trial, which it had been from the start. There's no real money at stake. Peter Pulitzer ended up paying more money to lawyers, accountants, expert witnesses, and other trial-related bozos than Roxanne would have happily settled for if the case had never gone to court in the first place. February the 18th and 19th. Getting toward dawn now, very foggy in the head, and no dexedrine left. For the first time in at least five years, I'm out of my little energy bombs. Nothing in the bottle but five Ritalin tablets and a big spansel of mescaline and speed. I don't know the ratio of the mixture or what kind of speed is in there with the mescaline. I have no idea what it will do to my head, my heart, or my body. But the Ritalin is useless at this point, not strong enough. So I'll have to risk the other. Oscar is coming by at 10 to take me out to the airport for the flight to Denver and Aspen. So if I sink into madness and weird hallucinations, at least he can get me checked out of the hotel. The plane ride itself might be another matter. How can a man know? Well, I just swallowed the bugger. Soon it will take hold. I have no idea what to expect. And in this dead, tired, run-down condition... Almost anything can happen. My resistance is gone, so any reaction will be extreme. I've never had mescaline. Meanwhile, outside on the strip, the zoo action never stops. For a while, I watched four L.A. sheriffs beat up two teenagers, then handcuffed them and hauled them away. Terrible howls and screams floated up to my balcony. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, God, please, I'm sorry. Whack! One cop picked him up by the feet while he was hanging onto a hurricane fence. The other one kicked him loose, then kneeled on his back and whacked him on the head a few times. I was tempted to hurl a wine bottle down on the cops, but refrained. Later, more noise. This time, a dope freak, bopping along and singing at the top of his lungs, some kind of medieval chant, oblivious to everything, just bopping along the strip. And remember that shooting scene in Alfie's? Also, the film opening with a man reeling into a plastic house, vomiting, cursing the news, picking up a pistol, and firing into the ceiling, driven mad by the news and pressure of upward mobility. Then, perhaps, to the classic cat on Amateur at Night, his neighbor's wife. And from there to the shooting at Alfie's. Yes, it begins to jail. Jesus, 645, man, the pill has taken hold for real. The metal on the typewriter has turned from dull green to a sort of high-gloss blue. The keys sparkle, glitter with highlights. I sort of levitated in the chair, hovering in front of the typewriter, not sitting. Fantastic brightness on everything, polished in wax with special lighting. And the physical end of the thing is like the first half hour on acid, a sort of buzzing all over, a sense of being gripped by something, vibrating internally but with no outward sign or movement. I'm amazed that I can keep typing. I feel like both me and the typewriter have become weightless. It floats in front of me like a bright toy. Weird, I can still spell, but I had to think about that last one. Weird. Christ, I wonder how much worse this is going to get. 
It's seven now, and I have to check out an hour or so. If this is the beginning of an acid-style trip, I might just as well give up on the idea of flying anywhere. Taking off in an airplane right now would be an unbearable experience. It would blow the top right off my head. The physical sensations of lifting off the ground would be unbearable in this condition. I feel like I could step off the balcony right now and float gently down to the sidewalk. Yes, and getting worse, a muscle in my thigh is seized by spasm, quivering like something disembodied. I can watch it, feel it, but not be connected. There's not much connection between my head and my body, but I can still type and very fast, too, much faster than normal. Yes, the goddamn drug is definitely taking hold, very much like acid. A sense of very pleasant physical paralysis. Wow, that spelling. While the brain copes with something never coped with before. The brain is doing all the work right now. Adjusting to this new stimulus like an old soldier ambushed and panicked for a moment. Getting a grip but not in command. Hanging on. Waiting for a break but expecting something worse. And yes, it's coming on. I couldn't possibly get out of this chair right now. I couldn't walk. All I can do is type. It feels like the blood is racing through me, all around my body, at fantastic speed. I don't feel any pumping, just a sense of increased flow, speed, interior speed, and a buzzing without noise, high-speed vibrations and more brightness. The little red indicator that moves along with the ball on this typewriter now appears to be made of arterial blood. It throbs and jumps along like a living thing. I feel like vomiting, but the pressure is too great. My feet are cold, hands cold, head in a vice. Fantastic effort to lift the bottle of Budweiser and take a sip. I drink like breathing it in, feeling it all the way cold into my stomach. Very thirsty, but only a half a beer left and too early to call for more. Christ, there's the catch. I am going to have to deal with all manner of complicated shit like packing, paying, all that shit any moment now. If the thing bites down much harder, I might wig out and demand beer. Stay away from the phone. Watch the red arrow. This typewriter is keeping me on my rails. Without it, I'd be completely adrift and weird. Maybe I should call Oscar and get him down here with some beer to keep me away from that balcony. Oh shit, this is very weird. My legs are half frozen and a slow panic in my stomach, wondering how much stranger it will get. Turn the radio on, focus on something, but don't listen to the words, the vicious bullshit. Jesus, the sun is coming up. The room is unbearably bright. Then a cloud across the sun. I can see the cloud and the sudden loss of light in the room, now getting brighter as the cloud passes or moves. Out there somewhere, much harder to type now. But it must be done. This is my handle. Keep the brain tethered. Hold it down. Any slippage now could be a landslide, losing the grip, falling or flipping around. Christ, can't blow my nose. Can't find it. But I see it in my hand, too. But they can't get together. Ice in my nose. Trembling with the radio on now. Some kind of flute music. Cold and fantastic vibration so fast I can't move. The ball just flipped back, a space capsule floating across the page, some kind of rotten, phony soul music on the radio. Melvin Laird singing The Wait. Oh, yes, we get weary, weary, weary. Some fuck-awful accent. Hair jelly music. Anthony Hatch in Jerusalem. Great God, the stinking news is on. Get rid of it. No mention of Nixon. Too much for a tortured head. Christ, what a beastly job to look for a new station on this radio dial. Up and down, the bright blue line and all these numbers. Quick switch to FM. Get rid of the fucking news. Find something in a foreign language. The news is already on the TV screen, but I won't turn it on. Won't even look at it. Nixon's face. God damn. I just called Oscar. Fantastic effort to dial. And the fucking line is busy. Hang on now. No slippage. Ignore this weird trembling. Laugh. Yes, that sense of humor. Snag it down from somewhere. The sky hook. Jesus, I have to lock that door. Get the do not disturb sign out before a maid blunders in. I can't stand it. I just heard one out there, creeping along the hallway, jiggling doorknobs, 
Ho, ho. Yes, that famous smile. Yes, I just got hold of Oscar. He's coming with some beer. That is the problem there. I can't start fucking around with the management, shouting for beer at this hour of dawn. Disaster area that way. Don't fuck with the management. Not now in this wicked condition. Conserve this inch of beer until Oscar arrives with more. Get a human buffer zone in here. Something to hide behind. The fucking news is on again. On FM this time. Singer sewing time is 15 minutes until 8 o'clock. Washington's birthday sale. We could not tell a lie. Our machines will sew you into a bag so fast you'll think you went blind. God damn, is there no human peaceful sound on the radio? Yes, I had one for an instant. But now more ads and bullshit. Now, right there. A violin sound. Hold that. Stay with it. Focus on that violin sound. Ride it out. Ah, uh, this beer won't last. The thirst will do me to fucking with the management. No, I have some ice left on the balcony. But careful out there. Don't look over the edge. Go out backwards. Feel around for the paper ice bucket. Seize it carefully between thumb and forefinger. Then walk slowly back to this chair. Try it now. Done, but my legs have turned to jelly. Impossible to move around except like a rolling ball. Don't bounce. Get away from that phone. Keep typing the grip, the handle. Jesus, my hands are vibrating now. I don't see how they can type. Keys feel like huge plastic mounds, very mushy and that bright red arrow jumping along like a pill in one of those sing-along movie shorts, bouncing from word to word with the music. Thank God for the sonata in F major for oboe and guitar by Charles Starkweather. No ads, listener-sponsored radio, not even news. Salvation has many faces. Remind me to send a check to this station when I get well. KPFA? Sounds right. The beer crisis is building. I am down to saliva in this last brown bottle. Goddamn, half my brain is already pondering how to get more beer, but it won't work. No way. No beer is available here. No way. Now, Tim, think about something else. Thank God for this music. If I could get to the bathroom, I'd like to get a towel and hang it over the face of this stinking TV set. The news is on there. I can smell it. My eyes feel bigger than grapefruits. Where are the sunglasses? I see them over there. Creep across. That cloud is off the sun again. For real this time. Incredible light in the room. White blaze on the walls. Glittering typewriter keys. And down there under the balcony, traffic moves steadily along the Sunset Strip in Hollywood, California, zip code unknown. We just came back from the tour of the Soviet Union in Denmark. Careful now, don't stray into the news. Keep it pure. Yes, I hear a flute now. Music starting again. What about cigarettes? Another problem here. And I hear that wily old charwoman sucking on the doorknob again. God damn her sneaky ass, what does she want? I have no money. She comes in here the rest of her days will be spent in a fear coma. I am not in the mood to fuck around with charwomen. Keep them out of here. They prowl this hotel like crippled wolves. Smile again. Yes, gain a step. Tighten the grip. Oh, when will this thing peak? It seems to be boring deeper. I know it can't be worse than acid, but that's what it feels like now. I have to catch a plane in two hours. Can it be done? Jesus, I couldn't fly now. I couldn't walk to the plane. Oh, Jesus, the crunch is on. My throat and mouth are like hot gravel, and even the saliva is gone. Can I get to the bottle of Old Crow and mix it up with the remains of these ice fragments? A cool drink for the freak? Give the gentleman something cool, dear. Can't you see he's wired his brain to the water pump and his ears to the generator? Stand back, those sparks. Back off. Maybe he's too far gone. Call a snake around him. Get that drink. Boy, you're slipping. We need concentration. Yes, the music. Some kind of German flower song. Martin Bormann sings White Rabbit. Ambushed in the Jungle by a Legion of Naked Gooks. Whiskey Ubales. Get that drink. Get up. Move. Done. But my knees are locked and my head is about 20 feet higher than my feet. And this room with an eight-foot roof making travel very difficult. The light again. Get those sunglasses. Unlock the knees and creep over there. Not far. 
Yes, I'm wearing the glasses now, but the glare is still all around. Getting out of this hotel and catching this plane is going to be weird. I see not much hope, but that's not the way to think. I have managed to do everything else I've had to do so far. 23 minutes past 8 on this brain-saving station. I hear echoes of the news leaking out of the back of the TV set. Nixon has ordered the Condor Legion into Berkeley. Smile. Relax a bit. Sip that drink. Bad pipes now on the radio, but it's really violin. They're fucking around with these instruments. Sounds like a tractor in the hall. The char women are going to cave my door in with a fucking web vehicle. A crane in the hall. Snapping doors off the hinges like so many cobwebs. Creaking and clanking along. This hotel has gone all to hell since the chain took it over. No more grapefruit in the light sockets, the lamp sockets. Put some lamp black on these walls. Take off the glare. We need more hair on these walls and crab lice in the rug to give it life. There are marijuana seeds in this rug. The place is full of them. The rug crackles like popcorn when I walk. Who planted these seeds in this rug, and why aren't they watered? Now, yes, there is a project. Tend the crops. Soak the rug like a drenching rain, some kind of tropical downpour. Good for the crops. Keep the ground damp and prune the leaves every other day. Be careful about renting the room. Special people, nature freaks, tillers of the soil. Let them in, but for God's sakes, keep the char women out. They don't like things growing in the rug. Most of them seem like third-generation fins, old muscle turned to lard and hanging like wasp nests. Wasp nests? Slipping again, beware. Oscar just came in, bringing beer. I seem to have leveled out, like after the first rush of acid. If this is as deep as it's going to bore, I think we can make that plain, but I dread it. Getting in a steel tube and shot across the sky, strapped down. Yes, I sense a peak. Just now, a hint of letdown, but still vibrating and hovering around with the typewriter. The cloud is over the sun again, or maybe it's smog, but the glare is gone from the walls. No highlights on the buildings down below, no sparkle on the rooftops, no water, just gray air. I see a concrete mixer moving, red and gray, down on that other street a long way off. It looks like a matchbox toy. They sell them in airports. Get one for one. I think we will catch that plane. Someday when things are right and like they should be, we can do all this again by putting a cord in the Holiday Inn vibrator bed and taking a special madness pill. But wait, hold over there. We can do that now. We can do almost anything now. And why not? Los Angeles, 1969. <laughs> We will kill the ones who eat us and eat the ones we kill. We had no choice. I moved quickly for the door, but he stopped me. Wait a minute, he said. We're almost out of whiskey. He was right. The old crow pint was empty except for a few drops down in one corner. The bars would not open for three hours. Don't worry, he said. I know where there's more. Upstairs in the president's office. Wonderful, I said. We can't run out of whiskey at a time like this. Go get it. We'll need everything we can get our hands on before this thing is over. He chuckled and tried to sprint off, but the thing attached to his ankle made him stumble. God damn it, he screamed. I'd kill to get rid of this thing. Don't say that, I snapped. We are innocent men. We are working within the system. And besides, I think we have some good crank outside in the car. He went upstairs to loot the president's office, and I went down those long marble steps once again to where my jeep was parked in front of a fire plug on the street. Hot damn, I thought, this will be a very fast day. It was still raining. There was not another sound on the street. Only rain in the elm trees and the fast, lazy slap of my brand new white low-cut Chuck Taylor All-Stars on the sidewalk. I felt like a polar bear and I wanted to hear some music. The big, weird jeep was still there, lurking peacefully under the trees and almost invisible in the mist and the hanging Spanish moss. It was huge, but it had no color came from the factory with no paint, only a dull stainless steel finish that soon faded to a filthy shade of yellow, and millions of tiny reddish pits all over the hood and the doors and even the panzer-style undercarriage. 
What you see here is priceless chemical development that was applied to this vehicle after only 55 years of careful research at our secret color color lab in the Milanese Alps. So you must be patient, he warned. This process takes time. It involves the slow liberation of astrobacteria, which is frequently lethal to laymen, and which did, in fact, end the life of the tragic genius who first invented it, a man named Squain from Austria. Well, maybe so, I figured. It was ugly and pitted all over with millions of festering poison pits, which boiled and bubbled constantly and infected all who touched it. But it was a full-bore Lamborghini hot rod, a monstrous thing that weighed 5,000 pounds with bulletproof glass, 12 cylinders with a top speed of 125 miles an hour, and a 50 caliber machine gun mount behind the driver's seat. One night on the Big Sur Highway, I beat a Porsche 928 from the Carmel Bridge to Nepenthe by nine minutes, mainly because I beat her like a cheap hound on the curves. There was a small woman driving the 928, and she went all to pieces when I passed her at 110 on the Bixby Creek Bridge and then squeezed her into the sand dunes. Why not? It happened to me once, in Sacramento, when some Japs and a brute Lamborghini ran me down on the parkway like I was standing still, then bashed me repeatedly at top speed until I finally lost control. It's one of the ugliest moments of my life, and I'll never forget it. Those tattooed swine... I should have had them locked up, but I was helpless. After that, I got one of my own for $150,000. That is another story, and I was too busy that day to even think about it. Dawn was coming up, and it was still rainy, and I had to be in court at 9 o'clock, and ye gods, I still had this freak to deal with, this gutless zombie with a beeper on his leg, who obviously needed help, and somehow I was it. How had it happened? I slid into the Lambo and locked the heavy armored door behind me, what dangerous craziness had plunged me into this situation. All I'd wanted to do was hang out in the library for a while and read some law. But somehow I wound up with Andrew on my hands. They had railroaded him into jail for 16 years. Now I was his only hope. One way or another, I had to get him into a courtroom situation where he'd be able to confront the system on its own mean terms, put him on the attack instead of always on his knees. Right. And the first thing we needed to get that goddamn beeping manacle off his leg. Indeed. But first things first. Calm down, cool beer, relax with elegant music, and yes, ah, uh, the crank. Andrew was looking a bit limp. And we would both need special energy for the ordeal I knew was coming. Once I broke him out of jail, as it were, I would be responsible for him until my lawyers took over. They were good, and I felt sure they could get him a new trial. Never mind this jail bullshit. He was innocent. He never had a chance, but no more. The worm had turned. My man Andrew was about to know what it felt like to go into court like a warrior and beat the swine to death with their own rules. I felt good about this, very calm and focused as I buried my face in a silver bowl of pure speed and snorted until my whole head went numb and my eyeballs seemed to be fusing together. I punched the music up to 600 watts and felt the jeep shudder nicely as Lyle Lovett came on. Thank God this thing is soundproof, I thought, or we might have a serious police problem. Which is something I like to avoid. But it's getting harder and harder. These are bad times for people who sit outside the library at dawn on a rainy morning and get ripped to the tits on crank and powerful music. As I walked back to the library, I remembered Robert Kennedy's words. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. But not me, Jack. Whatever I was doing that morning, it was sure as hell not nothing. I was about to pluck an innocent victim from the jaws of the system. Hell yes, I thought. Thomas Jefferson would be proud of me today, and so would Bobby Kennedy. The crank was taking hold, which caused me to think rapidly in odd mathematical terms and suddenly understand that Thomas Jefferson had been dead only 142 years longer than Bobby Kennedy, which is not a long time in places like Egypt and Cambodia, and approximately the same, in fact, as the life expectancy of the average American woman by the year 2015. I was brooding on these things as I bounded up the long gray steps and found Andrew fretting nervously on his slab in the main floor executive men's room. He had some rumpled looking Xerox pages out in front of him. But he quickly gathered them up as I entered. Where the fuck have you been, he snarled. I'm about to go crazy. They expect me back at jail in 20 minutes. I'm doomed. He eyed me sullenly and lifted a quart bottle of Southern Comfort to his lips sucking it down his throat so fast that his eyes rolled back in his head, and I thought he was passing out. You bastard, I yelled. Give me that goddamn bottle. 
I want you on your toes when we go to court. You're about to face a life or death situation. Screw you, he said. You're crazy as a goddamn loon. I should have had you arrested the minute I saw you. I gave him a quick prefrontal lift, bounced him off the mirror. Then I seized the whiskey bottle from his hand as he slumped to the floor. Get a grip on yourself, Andrew, I said. I gave him a rolled-up hundred-dollar bill and watched him snort almost half of our whole stash into his head like a bullet. He choked desperately for a few seconds, then leapt to his feet and fixed me with a wrong and unnatural grin. I could see he was going sideways. You fool, I said. You took too much. Fool, he screeched. Nobody calls me a fool. He laughed distractedly and lurched at me, but I shoved him away. Calm down, I said. We have serious business to do. Business, he shouted. What kind of business? He lunged at me again, but I could see that he was going into spasms. You business bastard, he jabbered. I know what kind of business you're in. Yeah, take care of business, Mr. Businessman. Then he scrambled up to his wet marble ledge above the urinals again, clinging to a pipe with one hand and fumbling in his pocket with the other. Be careful, I said. We'll both be fucked if you fall down and split your goddamn skull before we get to court. He stared at me for about twenty seconds, saying nothing. Then he reached down, demanding the whiskey, and unfolded the wad of Xerox pages that he'd been reading so intensely when I came back from my run to the jeep. What court, he yelled. What are you, the judge? Ye gods, I thought, what now? This poor fool had been in jail for so long he can't handle the crank and the whiskey and freedom all at once. Who are you, he screamed. What do you do for a living? Never mind that, I said. Right now I'm your skyhook. So come off that goddamn ledge and let's get some of the stuff on paper. We don't have much time. Paper, he screeched. What are you, some kind of writer? He laughed harshly. You want paper, shit eyes? I'll give you goddamn paper. Yeah, I'll give you writing, you asshole. If you think you're a goddamn writer, get ready to drop to your knees. Then he lifted the crumpled pages up to his eyes and started to read, but I cut him off. What is that stuff, I asked. Give it to me. He smiled disdainfully and jerked the papers out of my grasp. Stuff, he said. You call the stuff? Okay, I said. What is it? He hesitated, then smiled happily. This is my writing, he said. This is my stuff. This is probably the best stuff ever written in English, and it's mine. I wrote it when I was in jail, like Ernest Hemingway. Ernest was never in jail, I said, at least not like you. He never swept floors in the library at night with a beeper strapped to his ankle. It was cruel, but I felt the time had come to rein him in, to flog him back to reality. But he was getting hysterical, so I let him read on. Stand back, he yelled. I'm the most amazing writer in the world. I wrote this one night in the jail library, when no one else was watching. Wonderful, I said. Read your crazy shit. He hurled the whiskey bottle at me, but it missed and went into the stalls where it exploded against a wall and left glass all over the floor. Andrew ignored the explosion and began reading his work in a loud and menacing voice. He had obviously done this more than once, probably in solitary confinement. I listened curiously as he launched into the thing and started to get wound up. It was something about electric storms and Benjamin Franklin. But I was not really listening. My mind was on court. Meanwhile, Andrew raved on, rolling his eerie phrases like a man gone wild in a trance, and I began to pay more attention. Jesus, I thought, this is pretty good stuff. I recognized a certain rhythm, a weird meter of some kind that reached me, even if I wasn't listening. It was strange. I had a feeling that I knew it all from somewhere, but I couldn't quite place it. Soon I felt a queer humming all over my body, like falling into music, and for a long minute or two, I actually liked Andrew again. He definitely had a feel for words, almost like an idiot savant. By the time he was halfway through, I was ready to give him money. I was listening carefully now. He called his screed electricity, and this is how it went. Electricity. Electricity. Electricity, yes. Hunter, I just... Uh... Started with that first question again. I just, I just decided maybe I would ask you: uh, Is reality a pickle, or a prune, or a three-two joke? That's your. That's a question you've been waiting for all night. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Um, I'll say, I don't know. B. No. A pickle. Pickle. Well. A pickle. A three-two joke. Well, Hunter. Very, well, very drugged. Hunter, you seem. Wait, 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 let's, let's get this under control here. These people are. Hunter, you seem to be kind of a basic hedonist, like most of us, I imagine. Is that a true statement to begin with? Well, you said it seems that way, and uh, 
I think we should just leave it that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just to get on with my last kind of two-part question, I'd like to know what you thought of the Grateful Dead and what are six of your favorite things to do? The Grateful Dead are, uh, you know, has, has, has been for a long time one of my favorite bands and favorite people. <laughs> Favorite things to do, I like to uh, Come on, Dad. look at my watch. <laughs> See, to me it's 12 o'clock, that's what my watch does. I have a, a pocket, uh, in my pocket is a piece for uh, Jimmy Carter. I, I went to the party at the party last night at the White House, so I, you know, I he, he's the one I lost. He will take up just a few more questions. I was now. wondering what you let's, think let's, about let's uh, it, We have to make it numerically. I was wondering what you think about the humanity of the uh, neutron bomb. This is number one of three. What? Say that again. I was wondering what you think about the humanity of the neutron bomb. Neutron? <laughs> I, mean, I, I really don't uh, understand what you're saying. Neutron bomb. What's he saying? Neutron bomb. Oh, the neutron bomb. <laughs> you people talk funny. Uh... It does seem to be a, a, a really admirable achievement in, in terms of uh, almost the ultimate expression of capitalism and uh, technology. You know, a bomb that destroys prop uh, people and not property is, uh, like it or not, an admirable feat in the realm of technology. Uh, I'm surprised anybody could uh, treat it as anything but a horrible joke, but apparently they, the people do. It, 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 I think it's a perfect expression of where we are in this uh, country right now, in this society. <laughs> and it's almost inevitable. And it's, that's one. Number two is coming up. Who's that guy sitting next to you? Who's talking? Everyone Who's that guy questions? sitting next to you? <laughs> Who is this? Who's talking? No. Yeah, Freddie Earl. Say it again. I'd like to know if that cane you have has any mystical significance to you. And I'd also like to know if you think fascism is doing well in America today. Better than ever, you yeah. uh, Is that the cane or fascism? Well, fascism always does pretty well when people get lazy and uh, pissed off. Uh, you know, almost any uh, solution you come to when you figure, oh, fuck, I'm tired of that. You're thinking about this. We'll just kill those bastards. You know, <laughs> that's... Uh, Anytime things get, you know, the best of you, that's, uh, the natural drift isn't a, a fascistic uh, kind of solution. So uh, in a country where there are no solutions for the main problems, I think God meant us to uh, adopt fascistic solutions. Do you know anything about uh, the Wonder Vogel movement in Germany before the Second World War? What kind of movie? The Wonder Vogel movement in Germany. No. Okay, I defer my last question so we can get on with this and you can get what? some sleep. That's true. We have two more minutes and uh, two more questions. We'll take one thrown <coughs> ringer, one blind shot, and then one serious one. I never. I don't think about it much. <laughs> he doesn't bother me. What do you uh, want to know about him? That acid freak. That goddamn. <laughs> You want to know about what uh, Chancellor uh, his, his dope had it, habits? Uh, <laughs> who's? Oh yeah, come. He plays at Eva game. Uh, just what I'm doing now, except we're getting paid for it. <laughs> I was broke, yeah, and not quite sane. I'm still broken, not quite sane, but uh, the former has changed somehow. I was uh, ejected and rejected by almost every place that I... Uh, I have no... Uh, I claim Columbia just to embarrass Columbia. I went there enough. Question over here. What do you think of uh, Eldridge Cleaver's recent Jesus Freakdom? Uh, after like, have you ever after riding out from Chicago with Colson, I'm a little bit rattled because I have... Uh, did you meet him with Colson or was oh, really? No, but it's, to me it's the same uh, gig, I think. I mean, I have a very serious... Uh, now, have you ever met the man it. and what do you think of... Prison like, that's Colson's trip. 
Uh, I believe that if I read what Eldridge Cleaver, and we're looking at uh, seven or eight years in uh, Soledad, I'd damn well endorse anything rather than go, uh, you know. But and that's your own, I think, your own kind of private hell that I'm surely attach. Uh, yeah, this is Tex Colson's prison fellowship thing, and I believe he's serious. And there is a box number on it if you want to describe. That's uh, prison fellowships. Anyone, anyone want to write this box number down? <laughs> well, a bunch of cynics. You know, a man, a man can change. <laughs> but boy, for Tex Colson to change. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I don't know Eldridge, but I know what kind of perverse swine uh, federal cops can be. And can you imagine having to live with somebody who says you can stay free as long as you endorse Jesus and never admit it to anybody? Not even your bet. You know, the first time you even hint that you're kidding, it's right in the fucking alley with you. You know, zip into uh, Folsom. That 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 to me is as close to hell as you go on, on earth. That, that's that's what I'd do if I were a cop. Is to make him uh, repent publicly, and the first time, as a condition of the parole, which none of us will ever hear about, that if he ever laughs, if he ever get, doesn't do it with a straight face, it's right in the prison. <laughs> you know, we have a uh, up in that's the really that's an ugly kind of punishment. Well, to back to your thing with the game, if you look at that story carefully, and if you want to, we will. Uh, yeah, we probably should. Well, you just, you know, you would... Hang on, hang on, I, don't, I want to finish this up. Because, uh, in terms of literal truth, levels of truth, all I said in print was uh, that there were rumors in Milwaukee of, uh, that the candidate was uh, getting a strange drug called Ibogaine. And the reason that came to my mind was that I was just reading the press release from... Uh, Farm Cam Labs, and it happened to be on Eva game that week. And they had the, uh, you know, the symptoms. And it just occurred to me that Chip, uh, that's a, just like Ed Muskie to me. Cheers up for no reason. Yeah, I'm just looking for it here. Here we go. But I think in, in a lot of cases, I, this may be technical, uh, exoneration, but I think in almost every case, I, I, uh, it, I there's a tip-off that this is a, a, a fantasy. Uh, What's it, the, how do you tip it off that it's a fantasy? Well, let's see. The AP played with strength. Yeah, you know, that, that's what happened. The AP picked it up. A supposed drug or something like that. It's like, you know, relentlessly off. Maybe we should have all been so embarrassed with you. Well, but people, uh, here he, here he is, yeah. Well, let's see. Yeah, it knocked him out of the race. No, you did. Yeah. With this idol game. Yeah. Uh, like, the next time, like, and then, and then, you know, Ryder said this to me, he said, so, Terry, you realize what happened? I said, well, I said, well, Hunter just, like, you know, put a presidential contender, like, out of the race. Um, yeah, the front runner. Did you vote for Hunter? So I suppose it should uh, suggest the power of the journalist. <laughs> and it was a made-up item? No, 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 not at all. And that's why I'm, I'm trying to find it. I have. I'm scared. I'm just trying to figure where to start. There are problems with the story, don't you? Well, uh, not if you look at it carefully. <laughs> well, we do see if we see what we're doing now. All right, let's see. Uh, this is an italics break from the previous uh, scene. Let's see how you introduce this notion. Okay. I'm, I'm going on faith here. Uh, the most common known source of Ibogaine, this is a, in a clear shift from the right. previous... Uh, huge from him weeping from the podium. Right. Well, he's played everything, yeah. The most common known source of Ibogaine is from the roots of the Tabernathi Iboga, a shrub indigenous to West Africa. See, this came straight out of the farm chem, uh, it says. Laboratories, Palos of California. Indigenous West Africa. As early as, what? As early as 1869, roots of T.I., that's the uh, name were reported effective in... Is this, is this what? Rolling Stone? What you're reading now? Yeah, yeah. And this is what, uh, 
he, he picks up. Oh, and suddenly I was, uh, they was very exposed in the, the uh, freak seven. All right, as early as 1869, roots of TI were reported effective in combating sleep or fatigue and in maintaining alertness when ingested by African natives. Extracts of TI are used by natives while stalking game. game. It enables them to remain motionless for as long as two days while re retaining mental alertness. It has been used for centuries by natives of Africa, Asia, and South America in conjunction with fetishistic and mythical ceremonies. In 1905, the gross effects of chewing large amount, large quantities of TI roots were described. Quote, soon his nerves get tense in an extraordinary way. An epileptic-like madness comes over him, during which he becomes unconscious and pronounces words which are interpreted by the older members of the group as having a prophetic meaning and to prove that the fetish has entered him. Uh, all right, I'll actually go on here. This, it, the more you get every plan. At the turn of the century, the above the... Is, the hunter chooses to uh, suggest that the only way that the man can remain, you know, if you want to be not, you can be chewing out of it. I understand that, but why did you, uh, why did you, unless you had, did not really like the man from Maine, why did you pick this piece to stick just where it is? Because it turned up in my mail on that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's a terrifying thing to do. Have you ever had sort of vague regrets about that? No. No. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I had some about Humphrey, but uh, not about uh, Muskie. Muskie. Right here, now, so it goes on twice as long there, and, uh... you recall, of course, um, uh, Muskie denying that he took out of there? Didn't do any good. No, I mean, I mean it's like, the it was so, so. so raucously preserved that the, uh, the guy who was like a senior senator from Maine goes on TV and denies that he's like, addicted to a drug that no one has ever heard of. Ibogaine. <laughs> he, he feels that it's important enough to say, no, Ibogaine. Well, they were so crazy after losing Florida. In Hunter, I remember I was with him, I was thinking about it, it's like it's a time thing. It's like, you know, I mean, Well, here it is. Surely the most powerful. Completely changed the campaign. Have you ever had a, have you ever struck a blow as low as that? Is that? <laughs> oh, my God. Destroying this man, destroying his reputation. I've never claimed the uh, credit for it. Hunter was the first. Hunter wanted. Hunter wanted. Hunter wanted Gary Hart to the White House. No, but then it was Mugabe, and I figured. Uh, Excuse me, Mugabe. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. Actually, I did too. Political journalism. I, I've what's never. What's your language, Hunter? Like, is it rumored? You say. Yeah. All right. Let's hear this, though. All right. After the report comes off, describing all this, all the symptoms, the richness of the psychological experience. Many are disturbed by lights or noises. Dr. Claudio Naranjo says it's, I've been more impressed by the enduring effects resulting from Ibogaine than by those from sessions conducted with any other drug. Woo. Stand back. All right, paragraph to uh, sentence back to uh, Roman. It is rumored. Not much has been written about the Ibogaine effect as a serious factor in the presidential campaign. Quite though. But toward the end of the Wisconsin primary I've race. i got the man from Maine. Oh, hang on. But toward the end of the Wisconsin primary race, about a week before the vote, word leaked out that some of Muskie's top advisors had called in a Brazilian doctor who was said to be treating the candidate with, quote, some kind of strange drug that nobody in the press corps had ever heard of. Word leaked out. That's advisors, made up by you, right? I heard it. That's what we're talking about, the levels of truth here. Okay, all right, there, paragraph. <laughs> it had been common knowledge for many weeks that Humphrey was using an exotic brand of speed known as Wallet, W-A-L-L-O-T. And it had long been whispered that Muskie was into something very heavy. But it was hard to take the talk seriously until I heard about the appearance of a mysterious Brazilian doctor. That was the key. I immediately recognized the Ibogaine effect. You totally drank the lead. Well, I'm just reading it. From Muskie's tearful breakdown on a flatbed truck in New Hampshire. That's how you did it. Yeah. The delusions and altered thinking that characterized his campaign in Florida, and finally a condition of total rage. Quote, 
that gripped him in Wisconsin. There was no doubt about it. The man from Maine had turned to massive doses of Ibogaine as a last resort. Yeah, it was about to break down the only remaining it's possible word to suggest that is well, hang on, hang on. Massive. Yeah, that's <laughs> your only lot out is massive. Well, hang on. <laughs> it's it's no, the only remaining question was, quote, when did he start? Question mark. <laughs> but nobody could answer this one, and I was not able to press the candidate himself for an answer because I was permanently barred from the monkey campaign after that incident on the Sunshine Special in Florida. I remember that. Remember the yeah. bobo on the sunshine? And that, and that scene makes far more sense now than it did at the time. I had sworn, you know, vengeance on the bastards for barring me from the uh, campaign. Wow, quite a blow you struck. <laughs> yeah. Well, he made up a. All right. Muskie has always taken pride in his ability to deal with hecklers. He has frequently challenged them, calling them, calling them up to the stage in front of big crowds and then forcing the poor bastard to debate with him in the blaze of TV lights. Oh, God. But there was none of that in Florida. When the boo-hoo began grabbing at his legs and screaming for more gin, Big went all to pieces. Big Ed went all to pieces. Which gave rise to speculation uh, among reporters familiar with his campaign style in 68 and 70 that Muskie was not himself. And boy, we can take this one to court. Uh, it was noted, among other, thing, among other things, that he had developed a tendency to roll his eyes wildly during TV interviews, that his thought patterns had become strangely fragmented, and that not even his closest advisors could predict when he might suddenly spiral off into babbling rages, or neo-comatose neo funks. And it's, it's quite logical. In retrospect, however, it is e easy to see why Muskie fell apart on the ah, news well, platform. Watching this. All right, all right. Here, uh, now we get into a little, little more details. And this is all true as far as I know. We can only speculate on, speculate on this. He put a piece of Florida. Only speculate on this. Because those in a position to know have flatly refused to comment on rumors concerning the senator's disastrous experiments with Eva Gay. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I tried to find the Brazilian. <laughs> I tried to find the Brazilian doctor on election night in Milwaukee, but by the time the polls closed, he was long gone. Oh. One of the hired bimbos in Milwaukee's Holiday Inn headquarters said a man with fresh welts on his head had been dragged out the side door and put on a bus to Chicago, but we were never we were never able to confirm this. That sort of moves from into a wonderful lunacy. Well, God, you just go from truth to you go from those levels go from 